This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. Achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own Safety Pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. This is a special episode. We're going to have a takeover of my podcast. The Gen Suite team down in Cincinnati, Ohio, recently invited me to be a guest speaker on their podcast, The Voice of Gen Suite, and I am going to play that recording for you in this episode. Now, before I get into who Gen Suite actually is and what they do, which is going to be very important to you, I want to stop and talk a little bit about our partners in safety for this podcast. First of which is whosonlocation.com. Look, if you're like me, you've had to manage facilities, you've had to manage workplaces, you want to know who's on location, whether it's visitors, contractors, or even your own personnel, even at other locations. Well, digital-based, cloud-based technology, automation, whatever you want to call it, that's the way to go. If you want real-time alerts and information as to who's on location at any, any of your sites across the world, you need to know who's on location. Go to whosonlocation.com to read some more information about their service. But I'm going to tell you right now just a few of the things that you can do. One, you can have, uh, they support kiosk sign in, self sign in, self check in. They have web apps that are available for download for not just your employees, but also contractors to be able to sign in, check in, so you know when they're at remote locations as well. You even have the ability to uh, use their evacuation management tool as well for evacuations of buildings, facilities you can actually, even remotely, you could see in real time who's checking in at their, you know, uh, off the roster of who's safe and who's not safe. I, there's just too much to go into in the short amount of time I have uh, introing this podcast. But I'm telling you right now, if you want a digital cloud-based, you know, semi-automated solution to people management in general, you need to go to whosonlocation.com. Get a free 30-day trial, no strings attached, no credit card required, free 30-day trial. See for yourself who's on location.com. Another fantastic partner in safety for this podcast. Look, show some love to our partners. They help uh, make it happen every week. You need to know who the official floor marking, floor sign company is of the Safety Pro Podcast. That's none other than Mighty Line Floor Tape. Mighty Line Floor Tape. Stop painting your floors. If you need custom signs, you need aisles marked, fire extinguishers, eyewash stations, directional signs uh, for your floors, warehouse, production floor, doesn't matter. They have the solution for you. Look, their floor tape, seven times thicker than the average floor tape. Its beveled edge makes it perfect for forklift traffic. It's easy to remove with very little adhesive remaining behind. It's really, really simple. They have a great video showing the time it takes to install their floor tape versus painting. It's incredible. You're going to save a ton of time and material and your floors, your factory, your warehouse, they're going to look fantastic. Oh, and their floor signs, you can use your own custom high res logos and images. Get a free sample. Don't take my word for it. Get a free sample sent right to you. See for yourself. Go to mightylinetape.com forward slash podcast. Fill out the information, get a free sample. While you're there, check out past episodes of the Safety Pro Podcast. Fantastic partners in safety. Again, mightylinetape.com forward slash podcast. Okay, Gen Suite. What is Gen Suite? Well, basically it's a comprehensive suite of cloud-based EHS management software solutions, okay? If you're looking for a software solution, cloud-based software solution, to help you manage all of your programs, safety concerns, injuries, illnesses, near misses, you know, set up a calendar of compliance actions that need to take place and when and assign those to people in your organization. This is the suite of software you need to have. I've used GenSuite for years. 
No, they're not affiliated with this podcast in any capacity. It is a tool that I've used, I've relied on as a safety professional. That's what I do with this podcast. I share with you the tools and information that I have found useful, that I rely on, that I know will help you. So you should check out gensuite.com, G-E-N-S-U-I-T-E.com. Go ahead, check it out, read about you know what they have to offer. But you know, basically for over 20 years, they've helped companies establish safe and sustainable workplace environments all over the world. They offer intuitive applications for rapid configuration and deployment within your organization. Look, over 600,000 users trust GenSuite with their compliance and EHS software needs. You can too. Go to GenSuite.com for more information about GenSuite. Again, no affiliation, just a tool I rely on that I use every day actually now. So I want to go ahead and play the episode from the voice of GenSuite. I'll have a link in the show notes uh, as well. But this episode, we talked about wearables, the implications for EHS, the future of wearable technology, what Gen Suite's looking at as far as where wearables goes, and how they're innovating uh, within their organization to help businesses like mine and yours. So without further ado, here is the voice of Gen Suite. and welcome to the voice of Jen Sweet. I'll be your host and moderator today. Uh, my name is Jenny Yu. On today's episode, we are talking about the connected worker. For the last decade, we've seen the rise of mobile technology make its way into our workers' hands. It started with smartphones, but now we are seeing other technologies make their way into our lives as well, such as wearables. Smart watches and smart glasses have been gaining momentum and making their way into the employee workflow. GenSuite's virtual assistant Jenny Better version also triggered interest from companies to implement such uh, virtual assistant on mobile or desktop platforms to assist employee or team's day-to-day -day work. With me to discuss this topic of the connected worker today is our special guest Blaine Hoffman from the Safety Pro podcast. Blaine, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well, thank you. Great. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Jens with Vice President of Business Development Strategy and Innovation, Doc Martin. How are you uh, doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be uh, speaking on such a hot topic. Great. Thanks for coming here. Uh, to kick off our conversation, I'd like to start with our guest, Blaine. Uh, what kind of smartphone technology have you been able to work with or see implemented on site? Oh, man, all kinds of stuff. Uh, first, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here with uh, the Gen Suite team and talk about this stuff. Um, smartphones, I remember, I'm going to date myself. I remember when I got my first pocket PC. It was an HP pocket PC. Um, I only have one person in the room nodding their head. Uh, so the, 2003 time frame? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Windows XP Mobile Edition or um, uh, the the tablet, right? Mm -hmm. The first tablet. They, uh, so you straight away from the Palm device. <laughs> yeah. So I went away from Palm and I started looking at using those to do inspections and audits. And, you know, if you think about it, the smartphone today is just like that. It's just you have the ability to... Uh, make phone calls. Uh, as my teenage daughter likes to uh, ask me if that's still an option on her iPhone uh, to make phone calls. But uh, yeah, you can do so many things with them. And the biggest, I think the biggest advantage I've seen, the most widely used advantage of the smartphone is to just do inspections, being able to do audits and inspections and get away from clipboards or even dragging a laptop around. It's made it really easy to do um, inspections and take photos things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that. Uh, many of our customers are implementing our mobile app for their auditing and inspection programs. It's probably our most widely adopted uh, platform or yeah. application is the inspection module. I like photos. I like the stickers and drawing on the photos. When that's, I don't see uh, many other folks using that. Uh, effectively. So that's a really good feature that I like about the uh, Gen Suite mobile app. 
Mm. And especially with the offline capability. So even facilities without a site without the internet connection, they can still complete the checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, move on to the next question. So what kind of wearable technology have you seen implemented that has caught your interest, Blaine? Smart glasses, um, I, I think, you know, they were really kind of creepy to the general public when they launched, but um, they really took off in the workplace. But I think that's very intriguing. I'm interested to see the direction that goes. Um, and not to get too futurist, but uh, smart fabrics, um, I think, are very intriguing for folks that are working remotely in hot conditions, confined spaces, things like that, where you can monitor biometrics um, for uh, workers. So I'm really intrigued to see where that goes. How about your thoughts, Doc? I like the idea they're playing of these smart uh, fabrics. I had seen, or what perked my interest, was more of the uh, exoskeleton as a starting point. I know a couple of our subscribers are starting to experience this or pilot them um, and really find ways for safely lifting those heavy loads, finding a way to prevent those back injuries or the pulls and the strains and sprains. So that's one that really catches my eye just because of how different and unique it is. Um, but aside from that, I like the um, wearable tech for the sensor side. So what you're talking about with integrated fabric, I was thinking about it from the kind of heart rate monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, and how if companies that are, are deploying these with their employees can start tracking this data, how they can start to analyze it. Because not only can you identify when you're going into an area that has radiation exposure, you can stop yourself from going too far in. Or you can start to look at things like blood pressure. If people are working at heights, depending on the employee, how high they're traveling, et cetera, and you can start to adjust the way that you're managing their risk assessment or the PPE assigned to them to make it a safer experience for that employee. Now, it's a little bit of a far, far fetch right now, but there's a lot of data that these are collecting that's going untouched. So those, those are a couple of the, the areas in smart tech that I've been really interested in over the past couple of years. That's all exciting stuff. Yeah, I can't. The future is just going to get better with this stuff. I, but I'm a, I'm a geek, so I like the technology. Thanks, Bose. Uh, so, Blaine, just like you mentioned, smart gas entered the market a couple years back, and the focus of the implementation has been more and more shifted towards the work environment, and it has already seen certain um, uh, result and uh, uh, positive feedback. So, uh, could you drill down a little bit further to talk about some of the use cases you've seen companies are most interested to use smart gas for? Yeah, I think I can go to the private sector and also the uh, somewhat the military side, I've seen uh, the with the Air Force using more of a heads-up display type of technology in their visors and how you can kind of shrink that down and do a similar approach for private sector. Uh, just I can imagine somebody out in a wind farm doing uh, a service call, you know, you know, how many hundred feet up in the air and having smart glasses and being able to um, need both hands and not be able to have to pull a phone out to be able to verbally call up, um, you know, either a video call or a voice call uh, through Bluetooth, but also be able to see schematics, um, instructions, things like that, um, you know, remotely, sort of that heads up display type of thing. That's the thing I've seen um, used recently and is for maintenance technicians uh, that are remote. I think it's exciting. I, I like the idea of smart glasses. I, I'd like to see it get developed a little bit more in industry. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't know, a lot, I think a lot of people called it, made the call when it was, you know, it hit the general market of, eh, I don't think that's, I don't think we want to see people walking around with these, but in the workplace, it makes total sense. Mm. Then what's your opinion about the potential risk or potential distraction that could uh, be put to the employee using these smart glasses if you have the heads-up display? Yeah, so cognitive distractions, um, obviously when we're driving, uh, operating equipment, that could be an issue. I think the trick is to, one, not just integrate technology more and more into our lives for the sake of doing it, but it should, it should have a purpose, right? It should support our, the work we need to do in a safe and efficient manner. I think where it has some applications um, where on the software side, being able to recognize when uh, we're uh, in a vehicle or operating equipment, some things won't operate, won't function uh, properly. But 
if you think about taking your eyes away from you know, your, you know, the forward looking view, if you're operating a piece of equipment and look down at a dashboard to a gauge or something and look away, you know, there, there are some opportunities, I think, to kind of bring that up front and center where your head is forward and you're looking in the direction you're traveling. So a heads up display type of approach might benefit safety um, and limit distractions. Uh, I think it's something that should be explored, certainly. Thanks. It's also some of what uh, companies today are, or have had in place with uh, smartphone bands out on the shop floor. Because people are walking around the facilities, not paying attention to the yellow striping, the hazard striping, just staring at their phone, it's caused some injuries. So I agree that heads-up display really starts to, well, it doesn't replace your phone, you're still going to have that accessible. Um, it does start to get you kind of upright and looking back around the facility to make sure you're not in harm's way. I agree. Yeah. Mm. So, Doug, you already mentioned about the wearable sensors. Uh, there are so many different types of wearable sensors in the industrial world today. So could you share some examples your customers have piloted or deployed uh, or talked about for worker safety and perhaps they've already received positive feedback about them? It's a good question. Um, I know the folks at uh, GE Appliances, a higher company, have started exploring the exoskeleton uh, concept. Um, I know that a couple of our employees were down with them for an EHS summit, and the EHS team was getting the opportunity to try them out for the first time. So it was going into pilot. So that's probably one of the, the kind of early adopters for that. Um, aside from that, I know that we heard at our customer conference this year that uh, the folks from ThyssenKrupp were doing some of the heads-up display in Google Glass adoption where they were doing it in the, sh in the elevator shafts from a lockout perspective or from an uh, equipment maintenance perspective. So those are some of the examples that folks are actually going out to. Um, where on the other side I've heard is there's concern. I had an opportunity to present at a process safety summit um, earlier this year, and we were talking primarily about change management. So we had all these process safety change management leaders in the room, and we brought up the idea of wearable tech and all of them kind of raised their hand and perked up and said, how are we going to evaluate the impact of change on that? So I'll put it back, Blaine, to you on that one. What are your thoughts on how do you introduce a change management evaluation around smart tech? So was the concern about the safety implications, whether some of these devices are intrinsically safe and some of the chemical atmospheres? And that's part of it, but yeah. it's also introducing something new into the floor regardless. Your mobile phone's one thing. Right. Um, Google Glasses, are they um, break resistant? Are they intrinsically safe where some of the conversations brought up? Certainly having an ANSI rated safety glasses, uh, smart glass option is, is going to be a concern uh, for safety professionals. Uh, I've looked at that as well, and then I know there are some out there available. Yeah, just having a, a robust review process and a team to look at the potential impact uh, both to the wearer um, and the environment they're going to go in, how resilient it will be, uh, will it re will this uh, technology react in certain atmospheres uh, in a negative way? Um, that's all stuff that's got to be vetted. Um, certainly, we could start with you know ANSI and underwriters laboratories to make sure that the devices we're using are appropriate for the workplace. But yeah, that's something that has to be vetted. Certainly. Yeah, just to add, one of the uh, smart glass provider Genswood has been talking with and working with uh, Realware. They have the intrinsically safe model, uh, HT, uh, HMT1Z1 model, which is, uh, I think, the only product probably uh, certified for intrinsically safe. So, um, yeah, um, quite a few companies from oil and gas industry, chemical operation industry are interested to uh, potentially utilize that model. Another option might be to look at, I know there are companies, I don't know if FLIR is one of them, um, but in the fire industry for oh. firefighters, there mm -hmm. are uh, heads up display types of, uh, for the full face shield, uh, full face masks, I should say. And I mean, they're going into some pretty harsh environments. And, you know, as a former firefighter myself, I would have loved to have some of that stuff. We had the old boxes that we had to carry on us that would just beep and they have tones and we would have to recognize what that tone meant. Um, you know, an alert or a heads up display would have been fantastic, um, especially because you can't see. Uh, you can see your inside of your face mask, but you can't see, you know, depending upon the fire <laughs> that, that you're in, you can't see five feet in front of your face. So. There, there are, they're being used now. I think it's just a matter of 
you know, where can we leverage what's already been developed and uh, how can we adopt them into other and see where they apply uh, in other areas of work. I think the other area that our EHS community is always trying to figure out is who do you get involved in a company in order to vet, to try it out, to pilot one of these smart tech concepts? Um, our friends from Lilly over in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, I know that they're looking forward to it. EHS is one piece of a bigger puzzle with operations, corporate IT, et cetera, involved. Any guidance for how to properly steer through that maze? As far as getting folks in the organization to adopt this stuff? Comfortable or to with try it, it, able to try it out, correct. Oh, uh, wow. I'm probably, you're probably going to get feedback on this one. Uh, <laughs> start with millennials. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you, you got to have the right culture. You know, change is tough for, you know, most people. And when we're talking about handing somebody a smartphone versus wearing some, you know, glasses that have a camera and a microphone, you know, it raises some concerns. So you, you've got to be careful with the, you know, match the device uh, with the culture and the pace that you release these things. But starting small with a group of uh, folks that are, are willing to try some things out, that understand the value, and, and maybe that's where you start the value proposition, right? What this is, what problem is this going to solve? Is it going to make our work more efficient or safe? Um, you know, you start with that and you get a small group of people to try it out. But the proof is in the pudding, you know. Um, social proof is huge. I mean, just look out in the general market with any technology. Um, my, my kids are a perfect example. If they saw all their other friends using something, they're going to want it too. Uh, they're going to see the value in it. Uh, so that social proof, seeing their coworkers use it, um, I think is a good, is a good in. Mm -hmm. um, IT, uh, getting, you know, a strong IT department. You know, IT has grown a lot. Right. It's, no, it's no longer just the guy or gal, the, the, the tech nerd that sits in a room and, and helps me with my, when my email goes down. Um, these are uh, big players in business, and they're, um, they have a seat at the board table. And, you know, uh, technology drives a lot of companies now. So it, it's a big deal. I think it's, you gotta, you've got to have that value proposition. You've got to get the right people to try this stuff, and, and it's got to solve a problem. And it's happening in organizations already. It's just that not everyone at the facility knows. Right. So it's also uh, helping to identify that, share the information, share the success stories so that additional functions, not just an operations group or whatnot, can, can benefit from it. Right. Great. Uh, now we can switch gear to virtual assistant topic. Um, Doc, could you share a little bit about the vision of GenSuite to build Jenny, uh, which is GenSuite virtual assistant? within the GenSuite software platform? Sure, I, I was thinking back about this one because we've had the concept of our virtual assistant, Jenny, for a couple of years. And if I'm not mistaken, the original concept was we wanted to build something that would aid employees in logging or finding some initial data points. So how can you enable an employee to walk up to a kiosk to submit a concern report? But over the past 12 to 18 months, it's really changed with the, introdu the introduction of Alexa or Google's Assistant, et cetera. It's really changed things instead of just how do I get something into a product or get that one data record to be more of a true personal assistant. So I know most recently we've come out with things like product briefs, where as a site EHS leader, it's going to tell me the recent incidents that have occurred since I last logged into GenSuite. So where we're moving forward with it is looking at what else can we do? How can we expand upon the data that we're tracking about your personal pathway through GenSuite, what data you're putting in, what reports you're running on a routine basis, and start to prompt you with information to say, we notice that you run this report on a weekly basis. Here's the information for you. Instead of requiring you to go into GenSuite, go back to that report and execute that type of report. So it's been a real kind of change of environments with what, where we started and really where we're headed with it. But it's been an exciting thing. And I know, uh, again, our user conference, we, we really uh, introduced it out to everyone in a broad base, and it was extremely well adopted. And Jenny, I know that you have been uh, tracking some of the requests that have been going through, and it's not just for FAQs. People aren't just looking for guidance on how to use GenSuite. They're trying to figure out how to become more productive within the tool. Yes, uh Definitely a great point. Uh, apparently, a lot of our users have very high ex uh, in, uh, expectation of Jenny, so they've been inputting uh, or asking many new questions and commands, which 
Jenny needs to grow in order to master those commands. So very exciting roadmap and vision、um, you just mentioned. And I know that we're also adding probably one to two different commands into Jenny on a weekly basis right now.、Yes. We are expanding what's offered, what's available, what users can get into.、And、I think we have to figure out what what's the next step there, which is sharing all of those new stories and new commands, new options with our broad based、uh, user community. Yes,、uh, Blaine. So, what do you think of the value、uh, such kind of virtual assistant, along with artificial intelligence technology, can bring to companies' management programs and processes? I again, I'm、uh, a techie. I love this stuff.、Um, Alexa in several rooms in my house.、Um, I, I use this stuff all the time. I see. I definitely see the value. And I like Doug. I like what you said about sort of a, a daily newsflash, right?、Mm -hmm. Type of approach where you know I could go into the office and I could say Jenny,、uh, you know, give me an update or whatever, and it. I can get an update on any events that occurred. Well, you're getting a your briefcase out. You're getting、right. files structured for the day or mentally prepared. I love that. Listing it off. When can I get that? <laughs> <laughs>、uh, that that's a great idea. I, I would love that.、Um, it's sort of a, a nice spin on、uh, the old visual dashboard, where I would have to log in and pull it up and see the current state of things.、Um, mm -hmm. I could get it. Uh, dictated to me,、so、exactly. That's a fantastic idea. Ends up being an add-on, if you will, to your your schedule. Because one、mm -hmm. of the first things I think we all do when we come into the office is we look at our calendar. What, what、right. meeting do we have first? Are we prepared for everything? This is one adder onto that. As you're processing that, you can get the list of what are the the key actions that that are assigned to you and do today. I, I love that. I I like being the idea of being able to log a safety concern or a suggestion、uh, out on the shop floor、uh, with just verbal command. Mm -hmm. um, I have my my smartwatch.、Uh, I you know I would love to be able to do that without having to pull the phone out.、Uh, being able to, as I think of things, be able to just do the vocal command, the voice command, and log something,、uh, make a note of something. I like it. I like that、um, AI will. I, again, it gets kind of weird. Some people freak out about this stuff, but I you know I think it's just, it's inevitable. Going, it's coming. It is. It is here now. I mean, there isn't anything we can lament all we want, but it's happening. So I think the idea is to、uh, see how we can control more of it and integrate it、um, reasonably within our our daily lives. But in the workplace,、uh, I think AI is very critical. You got everything. You know, the Internet of Things, machine learning, AI. You know, all this stuff. To me, it's about how can they work seamlessly together. How can we integrate? That mean, like we mentioned, smart fabric, glasses, smart glasses, uh, watches, uh, sensors—they all exist now. But how can we string them together、um, in one? I don't know if ecosystem is the right word, but under one sort of、uh, system that they all can kind of talk to each other, and we can take advantage of them.、Uh, that's what I would like to see more of, because we have all this out there, but they're they're almost proprietary and they're separated. And I think some of the fear is there's so much data being collected. How do I know what point to track?、Right. And what we've talked about internally, I know even with our CEO, was you don't have to try and analyze every data point. Each one of these companies can tell you what are the exceptions. So with the smart fabric in the future, it can tell you once things get above a certain temperature. So you're not tracking the normal every day. Everything's good, but once it hits a certain threshold, then it can trigger an event. So, from a GenSuite perspective, it can log your event for you, can notify your EHS team, it can notify the employee supervisor, whoever was wearing said equipment or in a certain part of the plant, so that they can go inspect what was happening from an operational side at that point in time. So, again, trying to pull all those individual data points together is tough, but if you start to say, "Well, let's look at the exceptions or a certain threshold," it starts to narrow it down. Wow, you just—I、uh, just thought of something.、Uh, sensors. I can just think in a chemical storage area. If you had a sensor that detected a, a specific chemical escaped out of the drum or barrel, it would automatic. It would sound sound an alarm, but it would automatically log that as a as an environmental event in GenSuite. You wouldn't have to actually manually enter it. You would、exactly. just go in and follow up with some stuff. That's great stuff. We've great talked idea, with、uh, <laughs> some of the forklift groups. Yeah.、Um, you go into any manufacturing facility, and they're all banged up. Yeah. Nobody's reporting the fact that they hit something. Correct.、Yeah. But all of the new ones have gyroscopes on them, so you can do certain sensors, the amount of force that's been hit or or what it's run into. Right. So again, it can create an event and find a way to save you some money as you're going back to、uh, renew that contract with said、uh, provider. 
Now, if we can get it on a first aid box, that's my biggest pet peeve. I'll go, I'll go into a facility for the same reason. I'll, I'll see the damage on a forklift or a rail, but no reports. I'll, same thing with first aid. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody goes into a first aid box, half the band-aids are gone, but nary a first aid report. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it, people get freaked out about it, but I think the more we make it um, so, sort of automated, mm -hmm. you know, it's automatic, it just happens. Um, that the, I think the easier it is to, and it all goes into the pool, right? It's all mm -hmm. data, but you don't know what you need to track until you need to track it. So Correct. if you have the data there, you can then you can then pull for that for trends and things like that. But um, AED doors that go off, we have the audible alarm, but you know those should be connected. Um, you know, all that stuff can be connected. I see a future where we have. A, a system where all these things talk to each other and tie together instead of separate individual uh, pieces of tech we buy and just have them. It's just like you said, it's, too, it's everywhere, but mm -hmm. not where we need it, like in one spot. So. Okay. Thank you both for the great insights and comments. I feel like we can talk about the technologies forever <laughs> for days. So I'd like to wrap things up with a quick question uh, that would take us into the future of smart tech. So which frontier or emerging technologies you see could be uh, the front runners to enter into mass adoption in facilities? So Blaine. I, I'd still go with the smart fabrics and you know, as far as the ultimate wearable, um, I've seen them being the experiments and development in, again, in the fire service, um, the military, uh, being able to track everything from biometrics to the environment, um, you know certain conditions and integrate sort of the things the devices that we now use separately phone watch and, and into some fabric but you know the thing the thing that i think we have to get past is we have all these things like we if i want a, an infrared camera uh, FLIR makes a, uh, a a little device that snaps onto my iphone and it's relatively small it uses up a, a lot of energy a lot of battery right um, how do we integrate that into a headgear, headpiece, the, the heads-up display, the, what's going to drive that display, the Bluetooth, um, the SIM card, the, you know, we've got to, we've got to get that piece, the hardware right. I think that's going to, uh, in the future, what's going to make a lot of the stuff more adaptable, I think is the, not the concept, but the actual hardware the actual, how it fits, how we wear it, and how we power it. I mean, some of this stuff's going to take a lot of juice, so um, I'm not going to tow a battery around with me. But I think the future is going to be alternative power sources, uh, solar maybe integrated into some of these fabrics. I, I don't know, just some weird stuff, but uh, I, I just love this stuff, and I think the smart fabrics, I think, um, in the future might get a little more adoption. Um, I'd like to see that. I feel like you just recommended the industry to come to one standard for USB, right? <laughs> let alone a power to supply it. But <laughs> some really interesting things. I, I don't disagree with you. I think things like smart fabric, again, groups like CentOS, they're, they're producing the uniforms. Mm -hmm. If they can start producing them with the smart fabric, all of a sudden you as a company have all this extra data about those employees. It's going to be a fascinating uh, journey that that takes. But I think something that can be easily adopted now is as new equipment is being purchased, they're all coming with things like uh, beacons and beacon technologies or something that we've experienced as well, where as you're approaching a device, it can let you know that something's wrong. It can let you know that it has a pending inspection assigned to it. It can let you know that a certain belt has been running at a higher rate of frequency than it should be. So I think those are some things that are already implemented at facilities, as well as in new equipment that you're adopting or purchasing to put into your uh, facilities that Again, if we can connect that EHS and that operations team to understand that there's more than one benefit to using that technology, we can start to get some immediate payout while we're waiting for some of these other uh, ideas to come to fruition. Right. Great. The future is definitely bright. Uh, and with that, we are just about out of time. I want to thank our Genswood panelist, Doc Martin, for joining me on today's show. And of course, our special guest, Blaine Hoffman, for being a part of the conversation today. Thank you, Blaine. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening to The Voice of Genswood. Look forward to a new episode every other month. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, or at our website, genswood.com.
All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Voice of Gen Suite. You can check it out over there on their podcast as well. I wanted to play that for you. Uh, I got some uh, great information. Uh, it was a fantastic episode down there. I got to go on site, uh, meet with their team, and record that in their offices in Cincinnati, Ohio. A great group of folks. They work hard every day to make sure they bring the best. The um, They're on the cutting edge of EHS compliance technology and software. It's developed by EHS professionals for EHS professionals. I know this. I have been working with GenSuite again for years. I use their service and software every day, even, even now. Look, rest assured, this is a tool I use. I rely on every day. I've implemented it in organizations, and I'm doing it again today. So go check them out, GenSuite.com. And uh, while you're on the web, go ahead and check out our incredible partners in safety, Who'sOnLocation.com and MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Go check their services out as well. They uh, have partnered with me to help make this podcast happen. So uh, they're an important part of the Safety Pro podcast and bringing this to you every week. So go check them out as well. And until the next Safety Pro podcast, as always, be safe.